Great Sir Roland Hanna on piano, accompanied by Ron Carter, whose tune this is. It's called Blues in the Closet. This is from his 2001 album, Stardust, also featuring Joe Locke on vibraphone and Lenny White on drums. This is Lead Stories. I'm Utrecht's Lead, and it's another day. Uh, Just to give you a heads up, This is specifically for you in Chicago. If uh, you're available, give us a call so we can get a a line into what's happening even as we speak. Uh, Give us a call. 888-874-4888. What's going on? What's going on in Chicago is as of yesterday, there are two sides fighting over this crazy young man and his uh, made-up story about being the victim of a homophobic, racist attack. I don't even want to call his name. He doesn't deserve it. But we did talk yesterday about the fact that, you know, we see a familiar face emerging, and that is the face of Jesse Jackson as the mayoral race is at its very peak. Today, of course, is the election day in Chicago. Whoever wins will have made history because there are two African-American females who are vying for the post, and that is the history that would be made. It doesn't matter who wins, it will make history in Chicago. We talked yesterday about the fact that we see the emergence of familiar faces, these are political operatives, Jackson is whom I'm referring to specifically, and to some degree Sharpton, but Jackson, whose uh, rainbow coalition uh, (laughs) I question whether it still exists and whether it is valid as it exists. But in any event, uh, this is a way for Jackson to get back into the swing of things, to give himself some, some, some room to revive himself as a political force to be reckoned with. All this stuff to me is overstated. But, you know, people are entitled to think what they want to think. But in the meantime, what he had done the day prior was to have, and I I chastised the two candidates about it, he developed this accord that they enthusiastically signed that encourages a peaceful dialogue between the two of them, which is just to me, just plain useless. And beyond being useless, it's also, in my view, very sexist. It's also very, uh, you know, misogynistic, really. You have two grown women. These are grown women. They don't need a daddy to come into the picture to tell them what to do. It's, they're perfectly capable of making up their own minds as to whether this is something they want to do. But somehow Jackson has immersed himself again to be a, a, some kind of political force in Chicago using this as his entry point. And I think they 
unthinkingly provided him the entree to do that. Uh, they should shut it down as soon as possible, even though it uh, already has happened. Um, and it's on that basis that I, I sense a rat. You know, you, 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 you're forging your own way, win, lose, or draw. You have two grown black women. Handle it. <laughs> you don't need somebody coming in to come up with some strange idea that has not existed in politics before, where before the race is even run, here is, you know, the, 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 the senior person, politically speaking, uh, coming up with a strange idea that he is forging peaceful relations even before the race is run. You know, he should make a, a quick exit. He wouldn't do something that offensive to two white women running. <laughs> you know, he would accept, as they say, he would accept his place in such a situation. I'm hoping that uh, if they do nothing else, the, the candidates, if they do nothing else, they would very gracefully shut him out because he's not going to bring any good news for you. He's not going to help you or Chicago. He's helping himself. He's trying to resuscitate uh, what he imagined he had years ago, which was a position of privilege, uh, the grand old man of the party now, and uh, he's going to help these women who obviously are incapable of making up their own minds and uh, unable to function without the steady hand of some kind of a of an advisor he <laughs> you know you can't trust these people this is how they operate so i'm hoping that they they can spot this i'm hoping they could shut it out and shut him down you know smile and you know, <laughs> give him all the deference he is due. Uh, give him all that healthy disregard. Thanks, Mr. Jackson. Thanks, Reverend Jackson. We love you, but we don't need you right now. We'll call you when we need you. Thank you so much. I really resent that. And I resent it perhaps because I grew up in a household of, uh, what, eight men. And this kind of thing is just, it just sticks in my craw. You, if you are a powerful person and you're on your way, you're seeking to lead a city, which means that at least in your own mind, you have the wherewithal to do so, then go ahead and do it. You know, grab the bull by the horns and go ahead and do it on your own. You don't need people to come in and then be seen. And this is the thing that really got to me, the publicity of it all. Here's Jackson coming in as the grand, grand old, <laughs> the grand old man of politics. He's going to tell you what to do and you whether you knowingly or unknowingly allowed it to happen, you allowed it to happen. You start off on the wrong foot. Speaking of which, we have the matter of our, I had said before, and I know some people said, my God, you trees, you're being really, really rough on this woman. And I'm talking about the representative from Missouri. Who am I talking about? <laughs> well, according to the news uh, articles this week, in fact, that came out today, we have Ilhan, uh, oh, I'm forgetting her last name now. I'll remember it. I'll remember it in a minute. But she's up. She's the target 
of serious investigations. Uh, at the state level, back in Minnesota, she is being investigated for spending uh, campaign funds for her private use and for personal travel, which is, uh, you know, it's not a lot of money. It's about 6000 for campaign use and an unlisted amount for private travel. Okay, this could be uh, a total mistake. It could be confusion over, you know, how, especially new legislator, legislators, how they account for their money and so forth and their spending. Okay, I'll take that into consideration. Remember what I said early on. You can't tell me I didn't say it. I gave her some solid advice. And it was just two words. Shut up. That's what I said. By then she had embroiled herself in a war with Jewish organizations and Jewish legislators and, you know, talking about Semitism and anti-Semitism and everything that had nothing to do with her being elected as representative of first a, a state district and now a congressional district. She's fighting every day, practically. There was some headline about her embroiled in a fight. Embroiled in a fight for no reason. Okay. This is not about regulating speech. This is not about telling her what to say and what not to say. This is about, in fact, her political survival, which involves you reading the terrain, reading the landscape, but mostly shutting up. Don't cause a fight where there's no need. Instead, you use your time in study. You study what you're up against. You, you meet with people who could advise you well. You lay low. Your seat in Congress is barely warm. And right now there are at least five or six different things she has embroiled herself in, which she will not win. You can't win. Why can't she win? She has no ammunition. She has no ammunition with which to fight. She can't win any fight right now. So what you do if you're smart is what I said. Shut up and immerse yourself in study. Learn the landscape. Learn who are the movers and shakers. Build a constituency, both in your district and in Washington, D.C., where, ironically, you have a full spectrum of people from Africa that you should get to know. There are academicians right there at Howard University and other universities in Washington, D.C., who you might be able to call on to help you understand the dynamics, the political dynamics, not only in Washington, D.C., but uh, between Washington, D.C. and Congress. Advise you on what the issues are. You were not elected to be the Muslim representative 
from Missouri. You know, most of them, nobody wants to take that away from you. Nobody's threatening that uh, at you. Excel at representing your district. But every week, remember I said it, I said it early, and I'm not apologizing for the fact that th this almost seems suicidal. Why is it that you intend to short circuit your own political career, to sabotage your own political career? I can't understand it. Again, all you have to do is shut up. You just got there. And already you have all these fires going at the same time, and you can't put them out. You have no ammunition. And you seem to think, she seems to think that, you know, uh, if you attack, somehow that will get you noticed and people will, you know, miraculously come to your aid and, you know, you will prevail because you're arguing something that cannot be debated. Not the way you intend to debate it. You have no grounds. And for the life of me, I don't understand why this lady doesn't get that message. And she keeps stoking the fires over and over and over again. And people are watching the suicidal move. You are going to lose. Why? As I said, you're not prepared for the fight that you're starting. You're not prepared. You have no ammunition. How are you going to take on a fight with a well-armed opponent or with, with well-armed opponents and you have nothing to fight with except your mouth? The reason this is upsetting is that she ought to know better. And it is all the more upsetting that here she is in Congress elected, you know, she has a district, and it is, it might as well be that, that there is no person representing the district. But you are in Congress. Utilize your time well. Be smart. And don't go starting these fires all over the place. Unless you have one hell of a fire hose. <laughs> and you can put out all the fires all by yourself. And yet you're proving how weak you are, how vulnerable you are. And I am upset about this, observing it, because she's taking people along with her now. Uh, forcing people to take a stand. But that is not the stand. That is not the fight right now. The fight is not who is a true Muslim and who is truly a Jew in this country. That's not the fight. The fight is about your district. If you don't understand that, then you shouldn't have run for Congress. The fight is about your district. Understand that. The fight is about you becoming an asset to your district. I don't care whether you're Muslim or Presbyterian or Tao Buddhist. I, it doesn't matter. The issue is whether you are effective and whether you understand what you're there for. Your job and the reason you're there is not to start fights. 
and then leave it to people to, to deal with the fallout and to help you get out of the conflagration. It is clear you haven't yet established yourself, not even among other legislators, where they feel comfortable with the idea that you have a sane mind, not where you have your brain, your mouth is in overdrive and your brain is in neutral. You are a very dangerous person and you've got to understand that. That is not the mark of somebody who's got it, who has read the landscape well, who understands what she is obliged to do because she is in a vulnerable situation. And she hasn't yet earned the privilege of support from others. She hasn't yet earned that. She doesn't understand that. She will. Because you have to know how to fight and when to fight. And she seems not to know either of these things. But she starts fires that will force people, force them to fight when they have other things to do. The time to fight may come, but it isn't now. Now is preparation time. You want to fight? Great. Prepare. Where is your base of support? In Missouri and any place else. Where is your base of support? Who is going to protect you? And then, out of a sense of obligation and fraternity, you put other African American legislators and other well meaning legislators in an awkward position of having to, to decide to protect you. You don't deserve it. This is infuriating. And it's so clear she hasn't done her homework. And I'm talking basic homework. It's so clear. Speaking of which, a note to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Same kind of issue we see, but she's not listening. There's no question that she is a very capable, very smart, very energetic person with a good heart, well-meaning, and all of that. But she's chewed it all up already. She is another one who decides that she is to be known for her capacity to start fights. <laughs> that doesn't get you anywhere. Your capacity to win is all that counts. Anybody can start a fight. But it doesn't count. Making all that noise and uh, being seen in the middle of all this hubbub when the people of your district correctly are seeing you drifting away from them and the district and becoming more, shall I say, universal in your view. That's not why you were elected. You were elected to pay attention to your district. Do that. 
You were elected to deliver to the people who brought you into office, who made an investment in you to deliver for them. It's not about you now having arrived that you now take the broader view because you have grown. No. Fight for the things you told them you will fight for. And that you can fight for. And how I say that is you've demonstrated already you can mobilize people. You know how to climb the hills. You know how to fight. Then fight. But this is not about you now beginning to shape your afterlife, which is possibly a higher office. It's about you sticking to what you said you were going to do. You've already betrayed that. I don't care how many news conferences you call. I do know that we've called, but no calls to return. I, I don't take these things personally. I note it, but I don't take it personally. But I note it in the, in the continuum of where you see your, your, your uh, investment lies, which is to further your political career. I get it. That's typical of a political person. They want to go on to the next stop. I get it. And I don't take it personally, as I said, you're making judgments based on where you and your advisors think you ought to land next. But bear in mind that it was the people. I've seen this over and over and over again. And it's showing up so early in the game. People elected you for specific reasons having to do with the negligence directed at them for so many years. With the deterioration of their quality of life with their inability to enjoy just basic necessities, like a good uh, school system for their children, like a decent job. You're there pushing a whole different thing on the uh, basis that you are arguing now for the bigger picture. You weren't elected for that. You weren't elected on the basis of the bigger picture. You were elected on the basis of a very tight, tightly framed picture, framed by the needs of your constituency. Pay attention to that. And we, as voters, well, I say, well, I should say you, I, I don't vote. I stopped this exercise in self-immolation several years ago. And I decided I would vote if there is a specific reason for me to vote. There hasn't been one. So I, I, I don't vote. I don't like the idea of not voting, but I don't like the idea of squandering my vote and I don't like the idea of politicians expecting me to be so self-hating, so self-loathing, and so stupid as to have no value, place no value on my vote. No, I, I have no value for them. And so I, I wouldn't vote for them. I wouldn't vote, period. So we have to change our ways, it seems to me. If the politicians, this is why they go wrong. Nobody 
smacks him across the butt and says, you are way out of line. And you either toe the line or you're out of here. And this is not a joke because I told you the number one imperative we all have is survival. And nobody gets to play with that. Nobody gets to play with my survival. Nobody gets to regard it as just a casual thing. This is life and death for many, many, many people. I didn't elect people, and I will not elect people, so you could go, at great par- go to great parties, and you could hobnob with the hobnobables, and then you can uh, begin to construct your next move to a higher level, not based on what's good for me, but based on what's good for you. No, I will not facilitate that. And I will not, quote, see the big picture, unquote. They will have us believe in Chicago that the big picture is not that this jerk lied and made up a crime saying that he was attacked on the basis of his being gay and being black. No, what the story is there, and and people like Jesse Jackson and others are now coming to the, the, the defense of the state's attorney, who let him go? Dismissed all charges against him, let him go. That is the problem in Chicago and many other places where you have people displacing the whites who used to commit these kinds of crimes. And I'll give you a break. Based on the fact that I know you or you know so and so. And that entitles you to extra consideration. That is also part of the corruption. It's not about whether this is justice or not. They wouldn't know justice if it fell on them. And they keep trying to guide people's attention so that they can see the problem where it isn't a problem. There is no problem here. All the facts are quite clear. But you choose. And don't give me the business of, well, she's a black woman and we ought to support. No, 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 no. I'm not falling for that. You choose to operate in the same old Chicago way. Switching the color is not going to switch the problem you see you're part of the problem and you are continuing the old chicago problem of corruption and the only reason you considered suspending the charges is because he's got connections and another black person doesn't have those connections that other black person is going to be suffering the penalties that this bum isn't and you made that decision you made the decision to continue the old corrupt ways of chicago you made that decision Therefore, you should suffer the consequences. That's what people are not understanding. That would represent a change. You see, I'm real clear about these things. Because in the end, 
they're selling us the same story. As a black person doing these things, you are not improving anything. You are not changing anything. And you are bamboozling people because you're a black woman. And you made a, a, a compassionate decision to protect a black man. You're out of your mind. And it's okay if you're out of your mind. The thing is, I am not. I'm not out of my mind. You haven't done one thing that improves justice. Not one thing. Somebody who knows the president, the former president, Barack Obama, and who knows uh, the former first lady, Michelle Obama, was able to call in some chips. And you, a couple of rungs down the ladder, decided you understood what your instructions were, which is to get this guy out of the trouble that he made for himself. So selective justice, you're part of that. You continued it, you endorsed it. And you might have deprived somebody who truly deserved consideration, who truly was railroaded by the system. But you don't have the courage to do that, nor do you have the intention of doing that. Your job, as you see it, is not to challenge the status quo. You are part of the status quo. So I thought I would bring these things to your attention. And why you may find me a bit obstreperous and surprisingly combative when it comes to these things. I'm not falling for that game while well, you're a Muslim woman and I can't attack you. No. No, 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 no. You have to explain why you singularly decided that you're going to start a war that you cannot finish. Like I said, your mouth is in overdrive and your brain is in neutral. And you think you're doing something. Sometimes I think, you know, I, I would like to just get on a plane and go to these places, find these people, and let them have it. Give them a good talking to. Because they're doing such a great disservice to people who are trying their best to do the right thing, trying their best to support the right cause, the right people, and they get screwed every time. 888-874-4888 is the number to call. And let's hear what your reactions are. 888-874-4888. What are you thinking on the other side of the phone? The computer is frozen. That's the... <laughs> you know, I take this all in as part of, uh, you know, the, the cloud hanging over me. The computer has decided to freeze up. What can I say? But we'll see if it unfreezes. Uh, back in the studio, they'll write me a note and tell me. I'm saying we have to grow up as political persons. We have to grow up and not be so open all the time to uh, being, you know, wafted in this direction and then another. Henry from Chicago, good to hear from you. 
Hey, Trace, how's it going? Okay. So is your city right. blowing up yet? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, uh, you're you using dog whistle politics when you said Chicago. You knew I had the car, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> so what's this right. fight and wh where has it led to? All right. So, you know, we got the mayor's race today. Um, generally, it looks like um, Miss Lori Lightfoot might win. That is the prediction right now. Um, but, you know, uh, what you brought up was interesting um, in regards to what happened yesterday in regards to a protest by the Fraternal Order of Police here in Chicago against uh, Kimberly, uh, uh, the uh, state attorney here. So then there was a counter protest with a couple of uh, pastors there, and it just, it was all a mess. So, you know, that, 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 in the background of the mayoral's race, that, that seemed like there's something going on with the, 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 the maternal order of police because, for one, uh, the, the, uh, the chief of police here, uh, Eddie Johnson, he's worried about his job because, both of these candidates had considered, well, I know Tony Preckwinkle had considered firing him. Lori Lightfoot hasn't made a decision, but I think he's worried about his job, and I think they're trying to rally to get him to stay where he's at. Um, that, I mean, I think that's my thing, because I've never seen the Fraternal Order of Police, you know, do a protest. Like, you know, I've never seen that before. <laughs> so <laughs> the protest against uh, Kim, Kim Fox, who is the uh, Cook County State Attorney, um, but, you know, I, I think... Well, in a sense, in a sense, I could understand, not that I'm, I'm uh, endorsing, but I could understand where they're coming from, the Fraternal Order of Police, because they invested a lot here in, in, in uh, investigating what was then said to be a major crime, a, a hate crime. So they went gung-ho investigating this so-called hate crime in order not to be saddled with the blame for a hate crime, uh, you know, and they did nothing about it. They went about it. More than $136,000 spent in investigating this crime. And part of their concern was that they would not be blamed for a lackadaisical investigation. Only to have uh, the, the state prosecutor basically dismiss the charges, without them knowing, by the way, but to well, dismiss the charges and let this guy go with well, no well, explanation. Well, well you let me, let me ask you this, and, and, and I'm not totally defending Kim Fox on this, but she recused herself from this case. So Which is wrong. Why is she recusing herself? Why is she recusing herself from a straightforward case? What is the reason? Well, we, I mean, it, it, it's a high-profile case, but, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out. But, but this is not a high-profile case. You see, this is what I mean. This is part of the, 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 uh, the hype. This is a straightforward case. A guy lied about what happened to him. It's a basic lie, a basic crime. It should be easy to prosecute this case, especially since he admitted it to be true that he lied. So where is the complication here? Well, like I said, the complication, well, you asked the question, why did, why did she recuse herself from the case? But at the same time, if she recused herself from the case, was that her decision to drop the case? If she's not part, you know, if she just recuses herself, because we all know who the uh, who the state uh, who the state attorney's office was the one who was responsible for this. So why is she to blame for this? Well, she recused herself so that she would not inevitably be pointed at as a major reason for why this case went the way it did. And that is, some people called in political favors. 
meaning now we, we, we see the case now moving up the ladder to Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. And she knew. She knew this guy was lying. You don't recuse yourself because you know somebody's lying. That is a crime. You prosecute but such a person. Do, I mean, but do we, well, see, I, I'm not, I'm not very, I'm not very versed in legal, legally, but I, I'm just looking at it from a basic standpoint. I'm, I'm very ignorant of law here, but the thing is, is that I, I just, I just ask the question, if she recuses herself, why would, why would she be blamed for that? Because if I'm giving it to my, because uh, her job office, is to, uh, prosecute cases, not take sides, based on who the people are. Her yeah, job but, is to prosecute all cases coming before the court. That's her job. She's okay, not so, supposed to say, well, I can't uh, prosecute Bobby because I know his grandmother. <laughs> or I can't prosecute uh, Sandra, because she, I knew her since she was a student, a high school student. These things don't apply. The prosecuting the crime, not the person. So when somebody goes to the extent, not only of committing a crime, but filing a false police report, making up uh, the story, and continuing with the lies, I don't understand where the problem is in prosecuting this case. And then accusing yourself. Well, you I um I um I'll differ with you on this one. Um, but okay. you know, I, I I wanted to I wanted to say this because uh, and I think I mentioned this before. Um, there, are, you know, this we're going into a different era of politics uh, in Bill, uh, in Chicago, and it's 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 interesting because I think people need to pay attention in the next four years of what is going on here. Because uh, if you look at the high seats that are in Chicago right now, they're all most of them are actually occupied by black people. So obviously, you're going to have a black mayor. Uh, you're going to have, if, if Lori Lightfoot wins, then Tony Preckwick will go back to being the Cook County Board President. Uh, you have the, uh, Kim Fox, who is the Cook County uh, Attorney. You have the State's Attorney, Kwame Raul, who's a black man. You have the Lieutenant Governor, who is a, uh, uh, a black woman. So you have all these people in high places. How is black Chicago going to benefit or respond to this because we've seen cases where we've had a lot of black politicians and nothing is done for the black community. So this is, a, this is, this is ha interesting. You don't have to go any further. That's the crux of the issue. That's the crux of the issue, Henry. You could have 10 times more black faces with 20 times the incompetence and the compromises and those those new faces wouldn't at all increase the justice quotient for the Afri the, the average uh, Chicagoan. This is what we have to stop. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. This is this is something that, like I said, we need to take notes because if it doesn't, then this is a litmus test right here to say, hey. Putting a lot of black faces in high places isn't really going to get the job done. So that's why I well, say pay attention to what happens in Chicago in the next four years and see what happens to the African-American community in the next four years. I say stop it now. We don't have any time. People don't understand that. Well, the problem We're is... We're out have of time a lot. When, when uh, uh, Harold Washington died, all the way back then, We've been losing on the losing end since Harold Washington died in Chicago. When is it going to stop? We keep giving people more and more time to pull up their socks and, and to do the right things, and they don't, and they can't for all kinds of reasons. 
We don't need to give them, un, you know, to renew the lease. Because it's been hurting Chicago, all the people of Chicago, all these years. We're done with that. That's the signal that should uh, be sent right now. We, that's the, the reason for this election, to sweep this whole thing out. If you don't come up to standard at this critical time with this unstable president in the White House, and we are thinking strictly in terms of what's good for your career and how proud we would be because there's another black new black face in a new black space, that's not enough. And that insults the whole struggle the whole political struggle is not to have more black faces in, in high places. The struggle is for competence. The struggle is for people who make and truly are committed to making a difference. And we should be resolute about this. If they can't meet the standards, don't even bring them in. Throw them out. And, and, and I don't, I don't used to this. And, and I don't disagree with you at all. And this is what I'm saying, because some people still believe that if you put a black face in a high place, you're going to get results. And even after Barack Obama, people still believe that. So that's what I'm saying to those people out there who still believe that. Look what happens to Chicago in the next four years. There will not be a Chicago in the next four years, <laughs> not the way they envision it. Chicago is a mess. Chicago is in the process of, how should I say, self-destruction. So as to create a new Chicago, but not for the old Chicagoans. It's like Detroit. People are still waiting to find out what will happen in Detroit. I mean, what kind of medication are you on? You're seeing it. You're living it. All the statistics tell you that there is hardly a future or no future for you and your children even now. And we're still going along to get along like, well, somehow it will it will be fixed. And, you know, we just have to get the right faces in the right place. I don't know what it, what it would take. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think I agree with you. We're going to have to tear down the political structure here and just rebuild it from scratch. We do. We do. Uh, by the way, let me ask you, since you're an astute observer of your city, I want you to, uh, if, you, if you have any thoughts about whether there has been a change from yesterday to today with Jesse Jackson. No, not no change that that I've seen or, or witnessed. I I don't really pay attention to him. I mean, the only time I pay attention to him is when you bring him up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll stop immediately. All I can suggest though is you keep a sharp eye on him because uh, he's got plans, and it's so clear he's got plans. Thanks, Henry, and good luck. We'll see how it turns out by the end of the day today. All right, Who thank is you. going to be your mayor and whether you can still live in Chicago? That brings us to the end of our program today. I thank you for listening. And I'm so, I have no good feeling really about getting so angry uh, from time to time. But it's more of a sense of frustration, not anger, really, that people are not seeing things as they are and not reacting accordingly. But that might just be my own idiosyncrasy of wanting people to move faster and smartly, uh, at least in the direction of gaining ground in this long struggle that we've all been involved in, in survival. This is all it is. It's survival. And we're all in it. Everybody's in it. So why not 
you know, if we put all our energies together and compact them and redirect them, even if it gives us one inch of ground, I'll take it. One inch of ground forward, I'll take it. But we're not moving forward. That's my sense of it. We're not moving forward. And we really need to gain some ground away from this business of who individually is winning this or who individually is winning that. But how are we all winning if we're winning? Are we winning? That's the, the, that's the, the thing that is frustrating. Why can't we all just put our energies together for the specific purpose of winning against this very, very oppressive system? Thanks for listening. We'll see each other tomorrow, same time. And until then, just keep calm. <laughs> Bye-bye.